National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the second to last presentation for the Summer of Knighted series. This summer training series is brought to you by the National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect and the Brunford Brenner Center for Translational Research at Cornell University. As you can see in our schedule, this is the first of the research presentations, which we'll be ending our series on. I'm going to be discussing an ongoing study I'm doing using the Knighted Outcomes for Cohort 1. Next week, we'll finish off our presentation by accomplished an accomplished professor who has used our data extensively. She'll be doing a conference-style presentation on a completed research project, as well as discussing her experiences publishing off of our data. But as I said today, I'll be presenting on an in-progress research study. I'm a graduate researcher with the BCTR working on the National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect, where I do research with the Knighted data set, and then I also do um, kind of outreach with the data set, such as coordinating and hosting this series with Michael Deneen. Uh, but today we're going to be going over my progress so far on an ongoing study. I'll do a brief conference style mini presentation of what I found so far and then review the next steps I plan to take in the study. And then we'll finish as always with a Q&A session with both myself and Michael Deneen, the data manager for the NIDA data set. Um, we'll both be available to answer questions. So I started this project knowing that I would use the NIDA data set and hoping to create a research question that would leverage the unique linking possibilities of NIDA. Beyond that, I was relatively open to where the project would take me. So I started with a general liter literature search, reading studies related to the transition to adulthood for youth aging out of foster care. Then I took themes from the literature to generate ideas, picked a question and did descriptive analysis. I have completed an initial analysis and then I will refine my analysis um, with the director, with direction of my advisor and any feedback you guys have for me. Uh, but my next steps will focus on dealing with missing data, exploring the role of mediating variables, and perhaps some differentiation, uh, but that will kind of depend on sample size. <clears throat> so to jump in, to conduct my literature search, I started with Candle, which is the publicly accessible Zotero database used by the archive, which includes all of the research studies that we use in our data. Um, you may remember this resource from session two, where we discussed the data user supports available through the archive. After that, I explored sociological literature related to aging out, uh, then looked at psychology and human development databases, and last, I looked at some interdisciplinary databases, such as policy, public health, and social work. I used the following keywords, foster care, well-being, transition to adulthood, aged out, and institutionalization. From these keywords, I found articles that are related to my topic, um, and then I also searched through their references to find other related articles and use the features to see what articles had cited the article I was looking at to find additional articles. Um, that kind of last step at looking at who they cited and who cited them got me a considerable number of the articles, and this yielded a rather large body of literature on aging out of the foster care system and the transition to adulthood. From this body of literature, I just sold several key themes, three of which I thought about seriously and therefore included in my presentation. First, disability was a key theme that emerged across the research. Many of the research studies I examined ignored disability, while others brought attention to the lack of information about how processes and outcomes may differ between those with and without disabilities. There are also a number of articles that address the high prevalence of dis disability among foster care youth. Another key theme was questions related to if local patterns hold up in a national sample. There were several clusters of robust research that were using administrative data from local areas. Two common areas were the state of Oregon and a cluster of Midwestern states. Leveraging the national sample of NIDIN, I could address if these patterns held up outside of these research regions. Last, I found a considerable number of large or more national studies that used a cross-sectional research design. Another potential area of research could be examining these cross-sectional results in a longitudinal data setting. So after flushing these themes out a bit, I chose to pursue the theme of disability. Thinking about how to leverage a large longitudinal data set with a higher national representation, I developed questions that seemed to be missing from the existing literature, which I found particularly interesting. Eventually, I chose a research question that I felt leveraged the unique linking capabilities of NIDIN. I chose what is the role of demographics, foster care experiences, and child protective service history in the relationship between disability and incarceration, homelessness, childbearing, connection to adult, and substance use. I chose these outcome variables because of the importance of these outcomes for long-term health, economic success, and well-being. Um, and this was in the literature both for youth aging out of foster care 
for youth who just are becoming adults who had foster care experiences, and then just generally for adults as they kind of go through that 18 and up process, these kind of stood out as important indicators. So next, with help from Michael Deneen, shout out in the archive, um, he gave us our expert presentations and the linking presentation that was last week. Um, he helps me link the NIDA and AFCARS and INCANS data and then formatted the data. As a reminder, the AFCARS data captures youth experiences in foster care and the INCANS data reflected the youth's child protective histories. So using this data, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, I ran a descriptive analysis. I was curious to see if the averages for a variety of potential control variables, uh, perhaps service receipt variables, and outcomes were different between youth with and without disabilities. A little over 40% of the sample reported having a disability, um, and that's a, a fairly large percentage, uh, which gave me pretty good sized groups. So I ran an orthogonality test to see if there were differences by the means. I'm not going to bore you with all of the tables, but I will give you an example table and then point out areas across the data that there were no differences, uh, which is surprising. So on the left, I have an example of an orthogonality table using the knighted outcomes. Um, as you can see, there are four columns in an orthogonality table. The variables, the mean for youth without disabilities, the mean for youth with disabilities, and the p-value of the ortho orthogonality test. And so I was looking at the p-value on the right-hand side to see if the means were different by disability status. So for the knighted data, which we can see on the left, all but one variable had a p-value of less than 0.05. Uh, meaning that most all of the variables were statistically significant. The one variable where the mean was not statistically significantly different between youth with and without disabilities was public housing assistance. At first this kind of surprised me, um, but then I thought back to what Tammy and Talisa said in presentation one about how and why the data is collected. And so I thought perhaps a lot of youth who age out were receiving housing assistance with the independent living program. So perhaps for both with youth with and without disabilities, there were a high proportion that received public housing assistance. I mean, this is a process I really like to do early in a study. It helps me explore the data, get to know it, and then think through why we might see differences in areas and no differences in areas. Um, and then I looked at the outcomes with AFCARS. Um, I'm not going to show you that table, but there were no areas that were not statistically significant by disability status. So looking at all of the variables I had from AFCARS, there was a difference by disability status. I saw that youth with disabilities had higher numbers of placements, higher average number of days in foster care, higher average number of removals, a younger age of admittance to foster care, and there was a difference in the rural urban scale. Um, and then I also looked at reason for removal from the foster care data and found that children with disabilities had a higher percentage of removals due to sexual abuse, child alcohol abuse, issues related to the child's disability, child behavioral problems, and child abandonment. Um, but on the right hand, I kind of summarized the variables with my kind of final data set that links all three that were not statistically significant between those with and without disabilities. We can see it's public housing assistance, which I just talked about, the proportion of youth with CPS abuse that includes physical or sexual abuse, and the number of victimizations from the reports for CPS abuse. Um, but overall, I found that there was a difference by disability status for many of these, including my outcome variables. Um, so I kind of thought there was clearly like a there there. So I kept going and I ran some initial analyses, uh, which I'm going to present here today. So I'm going to present these kind of like a mini conference presentation style. So ignore my dorkiness in the beginning. Hi, everyone. My name is Erin McCauley, and I'm a graduate researcher with the National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect. And I'm going to talk to you all today about a study I did, kind of this is the early stages, examining how disability shapes incarceration, homelessness, connection with an adult, substance abuse, and childbearing during the tr transition to adulthood for youth who are likely to age out of foster care. So psychologists and human developmentalists have long hailed the transition to adulthood as a pivotal function for the long-term success of youth. This is particularly true for youth who are at high risk, such as foster care youth. Moreover, this transition can be especially difficult for youth who age out of foster care. The percentage of youth who leave foster care by aging out, which is also sometimes called through emancip emancipation, uh, has been rising steadily. In 2010, around 11% of foster care youth aged out, and these youth are at higher risk, and this transition to adulthood after leaving foster care is an important transition that has long-term impacts for their success and well-being. At the same time, youth who have aged out of foster care have disproportionately difficult backgrounds, even compared to other foster care youth. 
They are more likely to have experienced more transitions and greater placement instability and are less likely to have family or social relationships they can rely on during difficulty. Previous research has found that youth who age out of foster care have earlier pregnancies, struggle with homelessness and housing, and are in contact with the criminal justice system, and report higher uh, proportions with mental health problems. So I looked specifically um, at two different studies, so we'll go through those briefly. Um, this is a study published in AJPH in 2013 that found that youth who age out of foster care are at particularly high risk of becoming homeless. Around 31 to 46 percent experienced homelessness at least once before turning 26 years old. They found that running away while in foster care, greater placement instability, being male, having a history of physical abuse, engaging in delinquent behaviors, and mental health disorder symptoms were all associated with this increased relative risk of homelessness. 37 percent of the youth they interviewed um, or that were in their sample experienced one or more indicators of a difficult transition to adulthood. Once you can see here, they kind of talk about processes, like areas where people experience difficulty and then also kind of more objective outcomes. Um, so while many people struggled with things like um, having enough money, perhaps like a different percentage struggled with employment. Um, so that's kind of how they organized it. And so pulling from these different themes, we can see a lot of the outcomes that I looked at are here. So we have homelessness, incarceration, and then I looked at another study. This was a qualitative study on youth perspectives on aging out of foster care and transitioning into adulthood. Youth identified the following areas as having particular importance in managing this transition. Uh, first, they discussed self-determination. So youth talked about how previous experiences of autonomy were really important. They also talked about how coordination and collaboration of services was important and how reaching out for help was really difficult during this transition. And if they were turned away for asking at the wrong place repeatedly, they just stopped asking. Um, so having one place to go to coordinate services across areas, they found extremely helpful. They also talked about the importance of relationships. Uh, many didn't have family, but connection to an adult or someone on their side was extremely important. And for those that did have family connections, some discussed how having a family was a support when trying to go through that transition to adulthood, whereas others discussed how their families kind of acted as a burden instead, especially when family members were trying to rely on the youth for financial support during this transition, or if the family were involved in drugs or other criminal activities. Additionally, they discussed the importance of their foster care experiences for determining their success. Um, youth who experienced higher levels of trauma in their foster care experiences um, talked about how that made their transition more difficult, um, but also youth talked a lot about how normalizing their experiences with peer relationships with other people who have been through something similar was important. And then last, youth talked a lot about how having a disability complicated their transition and that accessing care was really difficult during this transition, especially if they had previously been given access to care uh, kind of through being in the foster care system. And so I really focused on that last area when kind of trying to draw upon the existing literature for themes. So across research study, a couple areas came up repeatedly in examining the transition to adulthood. Social support, mental health and substance use, childbearing, incarceration, homelessness or living arrangement, finances or employment, and public assistance receipt. In reflecting on these topics and what was available in my data, I chose a few to explore. Um, so I chose to concentrate on incarceration, homelessness, childbearing, connection with adult, and then substance abuse. And those are all outcomes that are in the NIDID, which we talked about during session two. And so this study seeks to answer the following objectives. Is having a disability associated with the probability of experiencing incarceration, homelessness, substance abuse, connection with adult or childbearing among youth who are likely to age out of foster care. And then additionally, I'm interested in if this association persists when controlling for youth's foster care experiences and child protective service histories. And then last, if this association persists when examining the probability of experiencing these outcomes after leaving the foster care system specifically. So for those of you who are here on session two, we talked a lot about how the coding of the knighted outcomes changes between wave one and the later waves. And so I'm most interested in the time period following the transition into adulthood. Um, but I did also want to see if there's a big difference in looking at the cumulative probability, so the probability that someone's experienced at any point in their lifetime. So to answer these questions, I use linear probability models and the NIDA data or the National Youth in Transition database from the National Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect uh, with the assistance of Michael Deneen, 
I linked the NADA data set with AFGARS and INCANS, and I examined three concepts, disability status, foster care experiences, and child protective histories. I looked at five outcomes, um, which I've repeated many times, so I'm not going to repeat them again, but they're right there. And I examined if youth reported having these experiences in their life or after aging out. Um, so if you attended session two, uh, we discussed these differences. Um, but for those of you who did it in the first wave of the United Outcomes, to ask the youth if they've ever experienced incarceration, homelessness, substance abuse, or connection to adult and childbearing, and that wave is collected when the youth are age 17, so before they actually age out. It's kind of like a baseline. And then the next two waves are after they transitioned out. And so then it's looking at kind of between 17 and the older ages, 19 and 21, we want to see if these youth have experienced these outcomes. And so we look at both, if we're looking at all three waves combined, so if they've ever experienced it before aging out or after, and then if they've experienced it just after aging out. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sample creation. So Michael Deneen, who gave the presentation last week about linking NIDID with AFGARS and INCANS, um, linked the data for me. So using the NIDID file, he linked participants back to their AFGARS and INCANS histories. So basically, he linked the youth who age out of foster care to their foster care experiences and then also their child protective histories. The steps we took to link the database are as follows. First, Michael linked the NIDID with the, sorry, Michael linked the NIDID with the foster care file. Then since the data format of the child file is a little different, I created a list of variables I was interested in. A child may appear multiple times in the child file and therefore have multiple reports. Um, so I wanted to kind of create summary variables to reflect their experiences. For example, using information from the existing literature, I thought it'd be important to know if the child's abuser was ever a parent. I was also curious if a child had ever experienced a certain type of abuse. And then I was interested in cumulative variables, which may proxy a level of contact, such as the number of child protective service reports. So I worked with Michael to create a list of summary variables that would be possible. And then Michael created a table with those summary variables and then merged this table with the data he had already merged between NIDID and AFGARS. So this was a pretty brief summary of how we came up with the sample. But if you're interested more in merging and you missed last week's section, I recommend watching the video. Um, so we recorded last week's session just as we record all the sessions to turn them into videos, which will release towards the end of the month. Um, and so Michael will really go through more in depth what he did, but we also already have a video that is on the web page with general instructions. If you were here for session two, we also looked at the link to that, uh, but Michael will also be here at the end if you have questions. But for now, we're going to move on. So looking at the demographics table, I have the means for the outcome variables by disability status. So we can see that those with disabilities had higher percentages experience homelessness and incarceration, lower percentages report pregnancy or substance use, and equal percentages reporting connection to an adult. Um, we can also see that the racial distribution is relatively similar. Um, however, there are slightly lower proportions of those with disabilities who identify as black or other and higher proportions who identify as Hispanic or native. Uh, when we look at the foster care experiences, we can see that those with disabilities had a higher average number of removals and placements, as well as spending more days in foster care on average. Um, then when we look at removal reasons, we can see that there are differences. For example, those without disabilities, a higher proportion of people had neglect as their reason, um, but a higher proportion of those with disabilities had child behavior problems than those without. And then last, we have the summary information from the child file. Uh, those with disabilities had a slightly higher average number of victimizations and higher average number of reports and a lower proportion experienced abuse by a parent, just as some examples. Um, so now we're going to look at the initial results. I ran a bunch of different models to kind of see what's going on here. Um, and so it is a little confusing because there's going to be a lot in the pages. So I'm going to go through a blank version of the tables we're going to look at. Um, and so first, we're, there's going to be a column where we're looking at disability as a predictor. And so first, I run a Iberia analysis. We're having a disability predicts the outcome for mo in model one. And then I add in controls for demographics in model two. Um, then I add in controls for demographics and foster care experiences in model three. And then last, controlling for demographics, foster care experiences, and child protective service histories in model four. This allows me to see how that relationship between disability and our outcome varies when we're able to control for different institutional histories. Um, and so basically what I'm doing is where all the little betas are, that's going to be the coefficient for disability out of the different regression models I ran. And then below I just tell you what I'm controlling or not controlling for. Uh, but beyond just using disability as a predictor, one area 
of research that I found in, in public health uh, that was looking at disability in other contexts, talks a lot about how types of different disabilities have different mechanisms, and so it might be important to differentiate by disability type. So I looked at emotional and mental disabilities next. And so I'm basically just comparing those with emotional or mental related disabilities to those with no disabilities. I'm using the same four models, and then I reran these analyses, but I looked at physical or sensory related disabilities as the predictor. And then I did this for each outcome, so childbearing, connection to adult, experiencing homelessness, incarceration, and substance use. And at this point, I'll present the models for you. Um, so first we're going to look at childbearing, but I will go through one at a time, so don't get overwhelmed. We have any disability, and so we can see that across the models, this relationship is significant. So having a disability is associated with a decreased probability of childbearing. In model one, we can see that this is about a 4% difference, um, where, where folks with disabilities are about 4% less likely. And then as we introduce demographics, so model two, we can see that this association becomes smaller, so it's about a 3% reduction, and then it comes back up as we add in controls for foster care experiences and child protective service histories, um, ending not quite as high as the bivariate relationship, but certainly higher than just controlling for demographics. Um, and then the top is after aging out, which is my main area of interest, but I also ran the same analyses for looking at the probability of ever having a child across the bottom, and we can see it's a fairly similar trend. The numbers are slightly different, but the trend is the same. And then I looked at emotional or mental, and we can see that this is also has a significant association with a decreased probability of having a child. Um, the relationship is the highest in model one. It goes down when we consider demographics and then comes back up again as we consider foster care experiences and child protective history. So it's extremely similar to the overall indicator for disability. And then I ran it again for physical or sensory where we do not see a relationship either after aging out or ever. So then I looked at connection to an adult. And I did not find any association when looking by any disability, so these associations were not significant across any model looking at ever or aging out. Looking at emotional or mental, I found the same, non-significant. And then when I was looking at physical or sensory, the main area of interest after aging out, there's also not a significant association, however it was significant when looking at ever. So I found this quite surprising, the kind of existing literature Based on that, I hypothesized that there would be an association here, so that was quite surprising. Next, I looked at experiencing homelessness. Um, so we can see for any disability that there's not an association. Um, however, for emotional or mental related disabilities, there is an association where um, having a disability is associated with about a 4% increase in the probability of homelessness in the bivariate model, and that stays the same when I include demographics. However, once we include or control for foster care experiences and child protective service histories, this relationship is accounted for by those differences. And then last, we see a very similar thing with physical or sensory related disabilities where we have a negative association in the beginning and then it is ameliorated as we move through. Um, so that association goes away when we consider foster care and child protective histories. And so it's interesting those are in different directions. Um, next, we look at incarceration. For the bivariate, there is an association. We're having disabilities associated with an increase in the probability of incarceration. Um, but this did not hold up when I included demographics um, or foster care or child protective histories. Um, so that relationship was not particularly strong. When we look at having an emotional or mental related disability, we have more of a persistent effect. So it stays when we include demographics, this increased probability. However, it goes away when we include or control for foster care experiences or child protective services history, which I also thought was quite surprising. Um, and then for physical or sensory, we have a decrease in the probability of experiencing incarceration, which is persistent across all of the models, meaning that this is a really robust finding. So even when we control for demographics, foster care experiences, and child protective services or histories, having a physical or sensory related disability is associated with about a 10 to 11 percent decrease in the probability of experiencing incarceration. We can see that having disabilities associated with an increase in the probability of substance abuse, um, but that it does not persist when looking at demographics, foster care, or child protective service history. Um, however, for emotional or mental related disabilities, there was a strong association that persisted across the models. So we can see that having an emotional or mental disability is associated with a approximately 2% increase in the probability of reporting substance abuse during the transition into adulthood. 
Um, but for fiscal or century, there is no association when looking at after aging out, and there's a decreased association when looking at ever. So to summarize the results across these many models and outcomes, thank you for being patient with me while we work through them. I know there's a lot. Um, that's typically how I do the early stages of analysis. Um, but I'm going to go through some quick points. So individuals with disabilities and emotional or mental related disabilities were less likely to have children. Individuals with physical or sensory related disabilities were less likely to be connected to an adult. The increase in the probability of homelessness associated with having an emotional or mental related disability and the decrease associated with having a physical or sensory related disability were rendered insignificant when foster care history was introduced. Increases in the probability of incarceration for those with disabilities and emotional or mental related disabilities was accounted for when we included our controls. Um, however, folks with physical or sensory related disabilities were less likely to be incarcerated than those without disabilities across all of the models. Um, this kind of surprised me, and so when I was thinking about this, it might be because this group is at a generally high risk um, because we're comparing youth who age out of the foster care system, regardless of if they have a disability or if they do not. I thought that was quite interesting. And then individuals with emotional or mental related disabilities were less, were more likely to experience substance abuse issues than those without emotional or mental related disabilities or new disabilities at all, whereas individuals with sensory or physical related disabilities were either less likely or there was no differences across the outcomes. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, so in thinking about what this all means, a few things jumped out to me. First, there wasn't a huge difference in examining the lifetime prevalence and the post-aging out prevalence. Um, there were a couple areas where we saw significant relationships for the lifetime, uh, but not for the post-aging out, but in general, they were quite similar. Um, however, there were large differences when differentiated by disability type, and in some cases, the, there was even a sign flip, um, so the relationships are going the opposite direction, and this indicates that there may be different mechanisms at play. Individuals with emotional or mental related disabilities were at particularly high risk of substance abuse. Individuals with physical or sensory related disabilities were either less likely to experience outcomes where there was not a significant difference. And last, I was expecting to see an association between having a disability and the probability of experiencing homelessness or incarceration among youth who age out. Um, but moving forward, I want to think more about why I'm not seeing this association there. Um, and then last, there were almost no effects at all when examining connection to an adult. Um, so I thought this was quite surprising and another thing to look into. But my biggest takeaway was that looking at disability broadly may obscure effects, especially if they're in the opposite direction. Um, and so that was something that maybe I should have expected to see, but surprised me a little bit to see the opposite directions. Um, and so when I think about my next steps, I'm definitely interested in doing a few things as I move forward. I want to deal with missing this and waiting. Currently, I just kind of did a list-wise deletion, um, and this may cause some downward bias. So I'm definitely going to deal with that using some of the tricks we picked up earlier in this series. I also want to re-examine the models, perhaps using a logistic regression, just to see if there are substantive differences. I use the linear probability models so that I could compare the coefficient, but I want to make sure that the individual outcomes between the different uh, modeling strategies aren't substantively similar. I'm also interested in interaction effects. Um, so I have some hypotheses about where there might be moderators, but I also want to go back into the literature and make sure I'm not missing anything and make sure that I'm grounding my decisions about what moderators to check in the literature. And then last, I really would like to differentiate farther if possible. So I, in a lot of the literature looking at disability, the intersection of race and disability um, is kind of a fruitful differentiation to make because often there are quite different experiences for folks across different racial or ethnic groups in regard to how, they're, how the outcomes vary by disability. Um, and I'm also interested in looking at a more granular disability type. So I created two broad categories, looking at emotional or mental disabilities and physical or sensory disabilities, but I could break those into four categories and just see what happens. It'll kind of depend on the sample sizes I end up with. Um, however, I think it is worth looking into since there was such a difference by those two categories. Um, but that's kind of what I've done so far, what I'm thinking. Um, I'd love to hear you guys' feedback. And then as always, Michael and I are both here to answer questions. Um, and just thanks, everyone, for, for bearing, bearing with me through that. So Jameson wrote, how are you planning on dealing with missing data exactly? Multiple imputation? Uh, yeah, so that, that'll, that'll definitely be my first plan of action um, is to go through and see. Um, first, so like I thought some of the tests that Frank led us through just to see what level of missingness is kind of random or not would be helpful. And then, yes, I plan on using multiple imputation. Um, I haven't started making an actual plan yet, but that's that's certainly my first plan of attack. Okay, we have another question from Valeria. 
great presentation and an interesting analysis. Since disability can be time variant, at what age did you ascribe disability? The most recent records are cumulative. How far back into APRS and NCANs did you track your United population? Fantastic question. So yes, experiences uh, based on having a disability can be extremely time variant as well as having a disability. Um, so for my analysis, I took the indicator of the disability uh, from when the youth were in foster care. And so that, um, I'm not sure at exactly what point in time. Um, Michael, you might be able to answer that because he's the one who pulled those those indicators from me, but it's it's before the time period where we're looking at the aging out. Um, and then how far back into AFGARs and INCANS did we track the knighted population? And so it really depended on when the youth had their first contact. So for some of the youth, their first contact was very early in their lives. We picked them up at that point, um, but for youth who perhaps they're kind of first appearance in the data was later in their life, then we pick them up later in their life. Um, but for the cumulative ones, we did consider like it's it starts from that very first moment of contact. Hopefully that answers your question. Michael, do you have anything to add in there? Different states uh, have different years that you can go back to. So it kind of depends on the state. And I'd have to look at my code to see if I fixed it at some particular year or not. I don't remember offhand. Yeah, I don't remember either, but I, I do know that it was before the aging out period where we're looking at the outcomes. Yeah, and your one thing that I thought might be a little confusing was on, on one of your slides it said uh, sexual abuse, and it, I, I'm not sure whether how people interpreted that, but I thought it could be interpreted two different ways. One is have they experienced sexual abuse after aging out, and the other was, did they ever experience sexual abuse uh, in the child file uh, portion? And, and it's that latter, it's the, did they experience sexual abuse um, in their earlier, at, earlier in their life, not, not after they aged out? Because there's no way of knowing whether they experienced sexual abuse after they aged out. Yes, thank you, Michael. So that was, that was under kind of the reasons area, if that makes sense. That was a control. Thank you, Michael. I'll make sure to clarify that in the future. I also, uh, while, I'm on, while I've got my, while I'm unmuted, I wanted to make a suggestion to you about your follow-up study uh, would be that since you had so many individual tests and, the prob and with a 0.05 uh, probability, cut off, then with so many tests, the likelihood of getting, you know, one in 20 that are going to be significant by chance is high, right? Yes. And um, so what might really help is if you did the same analysis with the 2014 cohort, mm. which is a completely different group of people, and see if the if those uh, things that were significant remain significant with a different population. Um, I think that would be a pretty solid, uh, it's like doing the same study on two different groups. Yes, yeah, Th thank you, Michael, that's a fantastic suggestion, especially, um, I mean, right now we wouldn't be able to go all the way through aging out because we don't have all the outcomes, but we would have enough and we could compare the lifetime prevalence. And just to clarify, like the next steps won't be a follow-up study, it'll just be me continuing this one. This is very early analyses that I'm sharing with everyone, so thanks for being so kind. <laughs> um, so we have more questions um, from Chris, uh, wonder if it might also be worth considering differences by gender. Excellent, excellent idea. I don't know how that didn't occur to me, um, but particularly when we when we look at the outcomes, um, those tend to vary by gender by themselves, but also um, for folks with disabilities, there tends to be a lot of gender differentiation in the way that people respond um, to different behaviors for different genders. So that's an excellent idea. Thank you, Chris. Um, from Hughes, sorry if I'm messing people's names up, I'm doing my best. Um, how did you address duplicate cases? Um, I'm assuming that you're talking about the services file, which I actually didn't include in my final analysis. So if that is what you're talking about, then that is the answer. But if it's not, uh, put another question in and I will address it again. Um, Gloria, where are the variables on whether a child has an IEP in school and their classification school interventions, um, and how might that impact outcomes? Um, I didn't 
I don't believe that we have any of those. Um, if you want to see everything that I could possibly have worked with, um, it's in the uh, code books for the three data sets. Um, but I think that might out influence um, outcomes quite a bit. Um, I do know that from reading the qualitative research in this area, that one of the issues um, that youth in foster care experience who have disabilities is that they have more frequent placement transitions. And so lots of times the schools didn't even set up an IEP and they because they didn't know that the youth had a disability while they were with them because of the bureaucracy. Like by the time the parents found out that the youth had a disability that required an IEP, they had already transitioned to a new school. Um, so that's definitely a big issue in this area. And so finding out um, that information would certainly enrich the outcomes. But as, as I'm aware, I don't think that we have them. Um, but yeah, I mean, school interventions would be a particularly fruitful area to move forward with these, especially um, if we know that, pe that people's experiences in foster care um, affect these outcomes, that if we could capture them in schools and do interventions at that kind of that same age period, that would be extremely helpful. Um, Hughes, I believe you said you use a knighted outcome. I noticed in the knighted service file, they're reported twice. Okay, so there's knighted outcomes and there's a knighted service file. I only use the knighted outcomes. I didn't look at the services that people experienced. But that might be a good idea. And there might actually also be information about if they had, a, if they received, um, in, if they received special education services, um, that would be in that that file. So perhaps merging in the services file would be helpful. And speak to both um, Hughes and Gloria's question. So I, I was totally wrong. There might actually be information on that. I don't think it has that level of information, um, but it definitely has if they received special education services. Um, and then Jameson said, will you use imputation or any other methods accounting for missing data to produce descriptive statistics? Um, perhaps statistics describing the proportion of youth who have disabilities and are incarcerated versus not. Um, I don't believe so. I Generally, I don't think you're supposed to use imputation on outcome variables, so I wouldn't apply it to the outcome variables. Um, and with disability being the number one predictor, I think my first round would just be to impute the other control variables, but not the predictor and the outcome. But I mean, you know, this is early, so I don't know where, where it will take me, but for now I plan to impute only the control variables in my three control variable categories. All right, I don't see any more questions coming up. Um, thank you everyone for participating in this. This has been really wonderful. Um, I was a little nervous to share such early results, um, but I just wanted to show you guys what it's been like for me kind of working through this data and kind of dealing with the challenges, especially with so many data sets in mind. Like, I think the probably the number one thing I'm gonna do next would be to look at the services file and look at um, if we can kind of add some information about if they had special education services while in schools, and that would be extremely helpful. So thanks for thanks for that lead. Um, but we hope that you guys can join us next week. Um, Svetlana Spiegel is going to be doing our last presentation. She uses our data a ton. She's, we're very, very lucky to have her giving a presentation. She's going to be talking about a published study that she's done with a little bit of detail. And then she's also just going to be talking about her experiences in publishing with our data, kind of the areas where she finds she has to explain the data to people. Um, so for those who plan on doing research projects with this data, I think it'll be a very fruitful discussion. Um, and it'll be our very last session. So we hope you close it out with us. Thank you, everyone, for participating. This has been quite a session. Thanks, everyone. The National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect is a project of the Bronfenbrenner Center for Translational Research at Cornell University. Funding for NDACAN is provided by the Children's Bureau.